Okay, so uh, the Skolt Sami are the indigenous people of the Kola Peninsula. Originally there were seven different Skolt Sami villages. One of them was and still is in Norway, Naden, and the other six were in uh, Russian side of the border. And then after the First World War, Finland got uh, uh, this area in Finnish, it's uh, Petsamo, Pet, uh, in Petsenga uh -huh. in yeah. Russian, for example. And uh, these three Skolt Sami villages were left on the Finnish side of the new border, and these three were on, left on the Russian side of the border. So split half and half, basically the culture yeah. split half and half? Yes. That's what they did in Africa too, with the yeah. African And uh, there weren't any real maps or anything of this area. They were like monastery and monks and they knew that there were people that not how many. So they just took something and put it on a map and that's the new border. So, so it, very arbitrary drawing. Yes. And you can see in this border, this black line is mm -hmm. the border of one village. So the new border of the countries went through the village. So, so like this half is this half? Yeah, so okay. this, this straight Ooh. line is the new border. And it actually went through the Suonikula village. So this side of the village was left on the Russian side and this was on the Finnish side. See, that's what she told me when we're on the way up here. Yes. Explain this. I didn't know this either myself. Yes. I didn't know any of this. Yes. And uh, in the beginning, uh, there was no problem with it. The, the Skolt Sami were living in the forest and there was like basically no border that they were living as before. But then at some point, the uh, Finnish and Russian border patrol started uh, controlling who's going across the border if they are spies or whoever. Mm -hmm. So it became impossible to cross the border. And like I said, the three villages were on the Finnish side and three were on the Russian side. So there were, for example, there were uh, yeah, girls from this village had married to this village or this village. They couldn't go and visit their family anymore because they were in different countries. The Russians wouldn't let them cross? No. And the, oh, the Finnish wouldn't geez. let them cross because they were afraid of Russian spies. Oh. So they were controlling the border. And what time period was this? Uh, early 20s. Early 20s. Uh, oh, mid, that yeah. time. Ooh, yeah. yeah, so it was after the First World War. Okay. That and, makes sense. Yeah. And then uh, this is called uh, Kramota. Mm. This uh, now resides in Inari. The uh, wooden box it was in is in the Sami Museum Sida and the actual uh, paper is in the Sami archives in Inari and uh, in the old days each uh, Skolt Sami village, village had their own Kramota and in that uh, paper was written everything that had to do with the village so it was written where the borders of the villages were. So each uh, village had their own and own, and the borders were written the same way on both. Mm -hmm. So if somebody uh, starts to say, they could check from the papers. And it's also very important because this, uh, in these were written all like the rights that the Skolt Sami had in the area that were given to them but from the uh, Russian Tsars mm -hmm. and for example when uh, Petsamo Monastery started claiming that the fishing rights belong to them in this area the Skolt Sami sent somebody to uh, Moscow uh, to complain to the uh, Tsar and yeah. from Tsar sent somebody who came to Petsenga and said that uh, Tsar has given this river to the Skolt Sami, so the church couldn't take it. Which, I wonder which Tsar, Nicholas or the Alexander? Uh, well, I have to look it up. I can yeah, look it up. The, these were uh, like hundreds of years of uh, texts. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of uh, 
write uh, written on them. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, In which language? Uh, Russian, because okay. uh, the, the Skolk Sami didn't know how to write, so there was somebody who came. Yes. Usually when they had the village meeting, which was uh, like a gathering where uh, they decided things. So if there was something to do with the village mm -hmm. that had to be decided, each uh, family had one vote. So they gathered and voted on things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually I think the most common was that uh, the Scot <coughs> Scot Sami were living uh, in the winter time, they were living in a winter village, which is, which is this black point here. And you can see from this picture, this is the new winter village. Oh. And each family had their own house. They were living in basically uh, in the sa same yard, mm -hmm. pretty much, yeah. during the winter time. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the Russian rule, there was a Russian school in the winter village and then uh, during the win uh, Finnish rule, there was a Finnish school in the winter village. And, Isn't that uh, interesting? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. And the priests only came to the winter village. So if there were children born in the summer, they would be christened in the winter when the priest came, unless the father took them to the priest. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but then when the springtime came, the Scots army left with uh, the Scots army families left to their own areas. Mm -hmm. Each family had their own designated area that had in many cases belonged to that family for many centuries. These little circles? Yes, each, cir each uh, circle is one family's area. And in those they had different places where they went during the springtime, the summertime, and then autumn, uh, based on where at the moment was the best uh, fishing, hunting, mm. gathering. And uh, Skoltsami had reindeers, but they didn't have enough reindeers to just survive on the reindeers. Skoltsami spent uh, very much most of the year fishing and uh, most of the, their uh, food for the winter was uh, the fish they caught during the summertime. Mm. Yeah. Did, did they dry the fish? Yes. So this is the se a cedar? Each cedar? No, no this, this is uh, cedar. cedar. And this is, yeah, the, this this is, is the, the cedar? The whole, the whole yeah. thing? Yes, and this is the family area. Yes. Okay. Within the cedar? Yes. Within the cedar? Yes. So, the, so that's like the, our tribes. Our, our, I'm Native American, yeah. so we had the tribes of the same exact thing. Like families had areas for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had the same thing in North America. Yeah, and like I was saying, the one thing that was written there was because uh, some areas were close to each other, and then when the time went on, in some families, for example, uh, if they had only girls, the mm -hmm. girls usually usually married and moved away. Mm -hmm. And then when there was only like the older couple and no younger people, they needed less food and th those, uh, therefore they needed less uh, hunting and gathering space. Mm -hmm. And if the, their neighbors had more children and they had uh, some girls who came uh, married to the family, they had more mouths to feed, they needed more food so they could adjust the family area based on their needs. Mm -hmm. So yeah. If, yeah, if one family had more area than they needed, they could uh, make it smaller and give it to some other mm -hmm. family that was bigger and needed more. Okay. So, mm -hmm. It's good. In that way, everybody survives. Yes. Yeah, it was very in <coughs> important during those times that the like the whole community survives. Like if uh, some family had a bad year, they didn't catch enough uh, fish during the summertime to uh, survive the winter. The other families who had caught more than they need, they would give uh, the other people the food they needed to survive because it was in everyone's best interest that the uh, whole community survives and no one's like begging for food. See, that's what Native Americans did too, the Dakota and Ojibwe tribes did the yes. exact same thing. If a family was need, mm -hmm. 
you share extra you never take more than you need but if you have extra you share yeah so it's the same value that i think it's pretty neat yeah and it's like uh it was very important it would uh like for the whole ecosystem of the village so if one family was poorer than the others and they, they didn't survive for example or if they didn't have enough food they might move away and that would uh that would, uh, I'm missing all the words, but it, it would have an effect on everything in the village. There would be less uh, men for the reindeer herding and mm -hmm. things like that. So it was important to keep the community well fed, basically. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So this is, how do you say this group again? How do you pronounce it correctly? I'm going to not pronounce it correctly. How do you uh, say the group in, again? In Skolt? English, it's uh, Skolt Sami. Skolt Sami? Yes. Okay. S-K-O-L-T. And which, so they're predominant in what land area? Uh, but just uh, mostly like this north central, like... Yeah, the Russian. Skolt, yeah, Skolt Sami lived in this area, but then uh, after the uh, Second World War, Finland lost this part oh, yeah. to Russia yeah. again, and then we can. Yeah, yeah, I remember after World War II, and then they lost that big section. Yes. So this is the then, area that Finland had and lost back yeah. to Russia after, after the Second World War. The war. I remember this part. Yes, and, and they uh, were in this part. Yeah. The Skolt Sami living in this area, along with everybody else, were uh, evacuated to uh, Finnish side of the border. Most of them were evacuated. To so the here? No, uh, that's the, later on the settlements. But they oh. were uh, evacuated during the war to uh, southern Finland. And oh. then after the war, uh, war ended, and it became clear that Finland would lose this area. Mm -hmm. uh, the Skolt Sami basically had a choice. They could go back to their traditional areas and live there under Russian rule, or they could stay in Finland and go to a new, new area. Mm -hmm. And uh, for most of the older people, going back would, would have been no problem. They had lived uh, before 1920, they had lived under the Russian rule. Uh, they had uh, gone to Russian school, many of them could speak Russian, uh, but uh, the younger generations who were very young before 1920 or were born after 1920, for them it was difficult. They had gone to Finnish speaking school, they had learned Finnish at the school, they didn't learn Russian, and especially the young men had just been fighting against the Russians. So mm -hmm. it was very difficult for them that they would now have to go and live in Russia. And then uh, they compromised and they didn't want to break the family. So they decided that all the Skolt Sami would uh, stay on the Finnish side of the border. And then uh, the Skolt Sami who were living in Patsjoki, Sida and Petsamo Sida, they were resettled to this area on this side of the lake Inari, mm -hmm. around Nellim. And then the Skolt Sami who were living in Suonikula, they were resettled here to Sevetia, where we are now. Okay. And uh, nowadays most of the Skolt Sami in Finland live, still live in the same areas, but uh, more and more people move to south. There are a lot of Skolt Sami in uh, Ivalo, for example. So they move from Nellim to Ivalo for work, usually, or from Sevetti to Ivalo. But then, uh, especially the younger uh, generations go to school. You can study like at Sevetti Army now, you can study until ninth grade and after that you have to move somewhere else mm -hmm. to go to school. And then when you go upper secondary high university, whatever you, suddenly you've been away for nine years, you may have a family of your own, you have an education in something that you cannot find a job here. 
so it's very difficult to return once mm -hmm. you leave. Just like on the Indian reservations back home yes. in the U.S., same thing. Yes, and like now here, it's uh, we don't really have any uh, like apartments for rent. So if somebody would like to move here, they would have to find somebody who's willing to rent an apartment for them, or they would have to have money to build their own. Mm -hmm. And many younger people don't have the money. Mm -hmm. so. can, can you say again how they didn't teach about the Sami in your school when you were growing up? Uh, Remember how we were starting our conversation? Yes, uh, about well, yeah. I went to school in here in Sevetiarvi and I was living in the middle of the culture. So here in school we had, uh, you could study the Skolt Sami language, mm -hmm. we had some uh, classes related to the uh, culture, we for example learned the traditional dancing and things like that, uh, some traditional handicrafts, but then uh, the, like in the southern Finland for example, there were, uh, if there were Skolt Sami children who went to school here, they probably didn't learn anything about their own own heritage at school and when I went to upper secondary high for example in my memory if my memory serves me right we didn't learn basically anything about the Skolt Sami in history classes there was one one brief passing in uh, the the fin Finnish language course where we uh, took a look at other languages and cultures and there we had something about the Sami in general but mm -hmm. basically not not much okay all right so I'm just wondering what what is the relationship with the Swat Sami and the, the Kibbe Sami or the other tribes which is going farther far east from the uh, Polar Pol Peninsula uh, are the language similar? Or? Yeah, they uh, belong to the Eastern Sami language group, so they are more similar. Uh, there are more similarities between Skolt Sami and Kilde Sami, for example, than mm -hmm. there are between Skolt Sami and Northern Sami or Southern Sami. Or, mm -hmm. What about the, the Inari Sami? Uh, Inari Sami also, Inari Sami is also more similar to Skolt Sami than to Northern Sami because it's Inari Sami also is in the uh, Eastern Sami language. Group. Yes, okay, I was wondering about that. Thank you. Yeah, but uh, one of the big, bigger differences is that uh, Northern Sami, which was mostly uh, or still is mostly spoken in Norway, mm -hmm. uh, when they were uh, like Norwegian people moved to nor northern Norway and uh, there was something new, for example airplanes came and things like that. Mm. The northern Sami took the words uh, for the airplane yes. from the Norwegian people. They didn't have the word so they heard it and they took it. Yes. Uh, the Skolt Sami took the word from Russia, from Russian language okay. and uh, Inari Sami took it from Finnish language. From Finnish people. So what is it in, in Skolt Sami? Uh, I don't know if it's still, it's Jarplan, which is basically, uh, my friend once told me that it's an old Russian word for airplane. So it's, it meant airplane at some point in history in La Russian language, but I think they changed it at some point. It's interesting. Yes. And how, the, how the majority language is affecting on the Sami? And I can also hear uh, the difference between the Norwegian side Sami, the speaking Northern Sami, and the Northern Sami uh, speakers on the Finnish side. Yes. Because the language has, the majority language has influenced on the Sami language. Yeah. So in some ways it can be dif difficult to understand it because it's, the sentences are built up on the Norwegian way of the gram grammar. Yes. And on the Finnish side, it's built up with the Finnish grammar. Yeah. So it's but, uh, yeah, it's the same thing that happened to uh, Skolt Sami. Mm -hmm. When the Skolt Sami from this area moved to Finland, and uh, uh, basically the Cold War started, and there was 
very little uh, basically there were no uh, possibilities to interact with the Skolts army still living in Russia and so they uh, if, uh, there were some uh, differences in how the languages developed from then onwards and yeah. yeah and I think it was like at late 80s at some point when when the first time the Skolts army from Seveti could go and yes. visit there was there was some cultural gatherings or something and, and they got the visas and licenses from Russia to yeah. so that they could go there. It was in the late 80s or? Yeah, uh, there were some like few few cases in late 80s but then after the Soviet Union fell yes. and it became Russia in early 90s that's when the border became more open and more, more, more um, possibilities came to go and visit and there were some uh, some older Skolts army who went there for the first time since 1940s or wow. 1938 for some and they found some relatives though so there was like for someone's uh, brothers children's children or something like that were still living wow. there but uh, wow that's yeah. amazing but yeah, but do you have any contact with the Scots army on the Russian side now? Yeah, we yes. yes, we've had some. Uh, we've had contact with them, and we've uh, visited them, and they sometimes have come here to visit if there's uh, like some uh, handicraft courses or some celebrations or something. We've had some visitors from Russia. Do you have but, a summer festival here in Sivetiarvi? Uh, is it still happening? No, sometimes we've had things like that, but now with the uh, corona and everything, the COVID, so uh, we, we're still... What about the border now, uh, after the Ukrainian war? Yeah. It started? Yeah. Is it's, it closed now? I, th I think it's closed now. We've had some... Uh, reindeer herders, for example, from Russia, who have sometimes come here yes. during the winter, and they weren't here this winter, and they couldn't get the visas and things like that. So it's very, very difficult at the moment. Yes, because and, of uh, the Ukrainian yes. Russian war. Yeah. And like the, uh, like this was the uh, traditional area uh, for the Scouts army, and also the three. Uh, villages on the Russian side, but the Scots army in Russia don't live in that area anymore. During the um, Stalin's rule, after the Second World War, all the like the minorities in uh, Petsam or Petsenga, like the Scots army, Kildin's army, Komi, I don't know what is it, is it Komi in English? Yes, yes. They were all put in villages. Um, I don't know what they are called in English, but Lobotsero, Pulitsero. Yes. So they were taken from the traditional areas and they were resettled to live in certain uh, villages. So and they were relocated to this uh, Lobotsero or yes. this uh, Luyavr, you say? Yes. Okay. Hmm. Yes, so that also uh, affected the culture of the Skoltsami and all the other minorities living in Russia. Hmm. Yeah. <sighs> wow. It's quite, a, it's quite a story. It's it quite is. A, I just yes. like amazing. I know just some part of it, but I don't know the whole picture. So, um, you know uh, um, Anna Afanasia? Uh, I the granddaughter of, uh, dances, stories, everything to do with what happened before was uh, taught it was like a oral history only. oral history yeah yes so the basically this is the only paper that really tells the history of the Scots army in so the, the the russians they they practically stole the history of the yes the Scots army pretty much yeah, yeah. that's a, yeah yeah mm -hmm. and i think yeah. one of the biggest reasons why they one of these was that uh, uh, they had the 
signatures and the licenses, whatever they were, from the Tars who came before that the certain areas belonged to Skoltsami and they could live they there. just confiscated it. Yeah, so without this, the Skoltsami had no way of uh, saying, for example, if there so were So this people. is ours, this yeah, is ours. Yeah, so, so there were, mm -hmm. yeah, there were new people moving to this village, for example, and if they didn't have this paper, they had no way of uh, proving that the fishing rights would belong to them. Sounds familiar. Yes, yes. It sounds mean. familiar. That's what happened to our people too. They, yes. They said, "Oh, there's no paper proving this is yours." Like, no, because you stole the paper. See, same thing. Same yeah. thing that happened to us. Yes. With this. Mm-hmm. Yes. So this is the, uh, the word of colonization. Yes. Colonization. I told my kids in the spring. Yes. It happened everywhere. This yeah, colonization. It's, so yeah, it's the did same. Did you study this or did, when did you pick all this information? Something uh, that you learned, of course, from the oral history, but... Uh, yeah, no, I just read stuff. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you learn something living here, you hear stories, but like when it came to, for example, the war, uh, and evacuations and things like that. The older people didn't really want to talk. I think it's the same everywhere. Yes. They didn't want to talk about that. But uh, like after 1920, when Finland got this part of Petsamo, uh, a lot of Finnish uh, scholars and uh, uh, students and filmmakers, bookmakers, people, Finnish people, they went there because it was something new and exotic and romantic and they went there and they wrote a lot of books so there are uh, quite a few books from uh, early 1920s for example about the life of the Skolts army but is it some kind of romantic no i i had one one story where somebody found uh, like uh, this one book and then they went to I think it's the National Archives or somewhere like that. So they found like the original hand handmade, yeah. uh, like when the um, when the person was here. So he wrote down things, mm. and they compared that to the book that was published in 1920s. And there was a lot of differences, but it wasn't like romanticized the story. It was the complete opposite that they took that there might be that she met a beautiful woman who was clean and had long white hair and things like that i'm just making this up what it mm. might have been like that and then in the book it was changed that it was an old woman living in a dirty cottage because that was the public opinion about the sami at the time pretty much mm -hmm. it, in this uh, southern Finland, it was like all the yeah. schools, universities, things like that. The Sami were like uh, dirty, and, uh, and dirty and small, and they lived in uh, like the uh, huts and things like that. And similar story. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. basically, the publicist mm -hmm. told the writer that they wouldn't uh, make the book unless he changed some of the things. Mm. And I think it's uh, telling you that the Sami were small and dirty and um, living in poverty. It was justifying uh, uh, the politics better to, to uh, assimilate into the mm -hmm. Yeah, the but it's, uh, the it's, it's also a difference of culture. So somebody came from the university in Helsinki and went to this village, for example. So people may not have money he was uh, trying to sell buy something Pe people didn't necessarily want the money because they didn't use it yeah. because they were living off the forest mm -hmm. they were hunting gathering of course they knew what money was and they could use it but it wasn't as useful to them for example as the axe that the person might have tried to buy from them because if they sell something, they had to make or find a new one, and it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Aiva. Aiva.
Can you um? Could you say your name to the camera and where you're from, so I can when I finish this, I'll remember your name. Yeah. The same, you know. Okay, I'm Jarno Mäki. I live in Sevetti in Finland. Okay, miigwech, kitas. kitas. Miigwech is my language. Means kitas. Okay. Or kitu. Spasip. Well, how do you say it? Spasip. Spasip. Yes. In your language. Yes. Oh, I'm learning a new word today. Spasip. Yeah, that's another like it's ki ki to like ki to yeah, and then I think it's ki ki to in Inari Sami. I'm not sure, but then the Scout Sami is passive. Passive uh, probably comes from the Russian spasipa. Oh because yeah. Thank you. In Russia, it's I got spasipa. you. Yeah. Okay. I would have stopped here because you got other people. I don't want to yes. take up all your time. <laughs> it's just an outdoor museum. So, look at these hats. Oh yeah, those are the hats. This is for the, the unmarried? Unmarried. Girls? Yeah. And this is for the married women? Yeah. And I think this is for the widows? I'm not sure. Oh, look at that beadwork. Oh my god, no. Sewing machine. Oh my gosh. Oh, this is really mean. Birch bark basket. Oh my goodness. This was. Wow. Okay, who's this? Okay, so the winter stuff here. The winter. These mosquitoes are nasty. Yes, now they are filling. 